1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. There the Apostle Paul writes, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. The late preacher Haddon Robinson, he points out something startling to us in an old recipe for rabbit stew of all things. The recipe begins with this injunction. First catch the rabbit. First catch the rabbit. Robinson then states, the writer knew how to put first things first. That's what we do when we establish priorities. We put the things that should be in first place in their proper order. It seems so obvious to have rabbit stew, you must first catch the rabbit for the stew. You need to put it in. We shouldn't need direction for that, right? <laughs> yes, we do. Well, let me give you my own recipe. My recipe is for building a church. Yes, ultimately Christ builds the church. But the recipe I want to give has to do squarely and directly for what a church is. And no, I don't mean everybody who calls themselves a church, as I've already stated. The Mormon church, Jehovah's Witnesses, even the Roman Catholic church, all call themselves a church. But that is not the church. So I want to give you a recipe for building the church. A true church. And here's my injunction. First, preach the gospel. First, preach the gospel. Establish your priorities. We need to put the things that should be first place in their proper order. I am greatly concerned with the modern church of Jesus Christ because we have not put things that should be first place in their proper order, namely the gospel of Christ. I am concerned that the pure preaching of the gospel is being corrupted in many of our churches. Not only that it is being watered down and rendered impure, but it's losing its preeminence, even being replaced in some churches and lost altogether. Now in our text, the Apostle Paul is setting the priority for a local church. He is giving the recipe for a true church. First, preach the gospel. Verses 3 and 4 read again. For I delivered to you as of first importance, as first in rank, as first in preeminence, as first in weightiness, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. It is the gospel that justifies the sinner in verse 1. It is the gospel that sanctifies the saints in verse 2. And it is the gospel that must be of the highest priority in verse 3. Now let me back up a little bit. Let me back up to define some terms for us. What do we mean by true church? I've said that these last two weeks. What do we mean by the term true church? Now, historically, the church of Jesus Christ has sought to define what marks or distinguishing characteristics must a local assembly have to be considered a church. 
Now, this is not so much about whether a church is perfect with no mixture of wheat and tares. There is no such thing. Or that a church is perfectly holy in its activities. Again, such a church doesn't exist. Nor are we saying that a person cannot be saved from their sins outside this church. No, First Baptist Church Garden Lakes is not the last true church on the planet, I assure you. From the scripture, historically the church of Christ has deduced three marks that must be present to be a true church. One, the pure preaching of the gospel. Two, the right administration of the sacraments or the ordinances. And three, the practice of church discipline to remove sin. These three distinguishing marks practiced constitute a true church of Jesus Christ. I emphasize practice because most Protestant churches have confessions, have creeds, have catechisms, and they will state that they hold to those three marks, but they may not practice them. They may still be considered a local church, but they are false, a false church due to their non-practice of those marks. Now, let me spend several minutes dealing with what the gospel is. All right. You're going to hear that word ad nauseum out of my mouth this morning. You probably hear it everywhere you go in church. But I want to spend a few minutes explaining that. In verse 1 of chapter 15, Paul literally says to the Corinthian saints, Now I remind you, brothers, of the gospel which I gospelized unto you. That's what he literally says to them. Of the gospel which I gospelized unto you. What is this gospel that he gospelized to them? As I said, this word gospel it is a word that we use everywhere in church. But in some respects, I fear it's lost its meaning. If you listen to Christian music, Christian radio, podcasts, or pastors, they're all defining the gospel, but are they defining it as Paul uses it here? That's the question. Are they defining the gospel as Paul uses it here? Now, one man I heard defined the gospel as music. Another man said the gospel is love. Others say it's social justice and social equity, social equality. Scores of churches define the gospel as being the hands and the feet of Jesus. Still others say the gospel is to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with God. You've probably seen the license plate. There was a pastor who asked a group of Christians at a local collegiate Bible study. These are college students. At a Bible study, young men and women there training in the Bible. The question was this, what is the gospel? What is the gospel? Sadly, he writes, the answers they gave significantly varied. One said, it is the way of life. Another said, it is asking Jesus in your heart. Another said, the gospel is all of God's word. Still another man began to explain that the gospel was God getting him through a painful divorce that he had just gone through. Another man said, the gospel is about doing what is right in life. So which of the students gave the right answer? Is there even such thing as a right answer, he asked. In a room full of professing Christian students, there was not even near agreement on the gospel. There was not even any near agreement on it. But even more concerning is that not one student seemed to be troubled by the differing definition. They couldn't agree on what the 
They all had different understandings of it. It's subjective to each one. It's whatever you deem it to be. The gospel is quickly becoming Christianese for personal feelings or for actions or for experiences. See, what's happening is that many professing Christians are taking the liberty to change or even replace the gospel meaning meaning we began implications of the gospel or implications of the gospel confusing our experiences or our feelings or our activities for the gospel. A theologian of A.W. Pink, he made an astonishing observation some 75 years ago. He writes, the gospel which is now being proclaimed is in nine out of every ten but a perversion of the truth. And tens of thousands assured that they are bound for heaven are now hastening to hell as fast as time can take them. Things are far, far worse in Christendom than even the pessimist and the alarmist suppose. He was convinced that every nine out of ten gospel presentations were perversions of the true gospel. Now this seems outlandish. How could he make such a statement? Nine out of every ten gospel presentations were a perversion of the gospel? The truth is being twisted? How did he come to such a conclusion? Well... He listened to preaching. He heard fallacy fallacy from the pulpit. New techniques were being employed. How ways to took shape. New ideas for converts seized the churches. New definitions of the gospel rose up and scores of false converts were being added to the visible church and the membership church roles swelled. And churches convinced themselves that they were being gospel first, gospel centered, gospel faithful because their numbers rose and the churches were filled. Churches in the redefining of gospel are omitting essential elements of they are its power and rendering it corrupt and worthless. Gospel Wrath and sin. And necessary. They omitted the sinners condemned standing before God, for we're all God's children. They rejected the terrifying reality of eternal hell, substituting it with a softer concept of soul sleep and soul annihilation. Pastors and teachers are taming the biblical gospel, omitting what is central and primary, reducing it from a command to a mere suggestion, a mere suggestion of how to come and how to have a fulfilled life. How to have a feel better gospel. A gospel that adds Jesus to it by doing Jesus stuff. This phenomenon caused the late theologian J.I. Packer to say the result of these omissions is that part of the biblical gospel is now preached as if it were the whole of that gospel. And a half-truth masquerading as the whole truth becomes a complete untruth. It's taking the biblical gospel 
and twisting it, perverting it, shifting it, just ever so slightly moving it. And now it is a half-truth masquerading as the truth, and it's really an untruth. Now, what do I mean by that we redefine the gospel as a feel-better gospel? A gospel that adds Jesus to it by doing Jesus stuff. What am I getting at here? Quite simply, modern churches have begun to operate underneath the banner of this. Of first importance. Of preeminence. Of the thing that ranks first. We are to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. This is the banner that many churches operate under. We started believing that the gospel is fully contained in what we are doing for others. I remember hearing a long time ago the old quote, preach the gospel at all times and if necessary, use words. It's a quote that's been around for centuries. Maybe you've heard it. Preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. I thought that was such a good quote. I remember quoting it and just thinking how profound it is. It's emphasizing the need to demonstrate Christ. To allow what I do to others to be a reflection of Christ's love. I put Jesus' love on full display in living color, preaching the gospel loudly through my activities. It's really become the functional gospel of the modern church. We believe primarily and most importantly in preaching the gospel by what we do rather than what we say. I know now that that quote is fraught with error. It is loaded with error. This is the hands and feet of Jesus' gospel. Our modern churches, in an effort to promote the gospel, have omitted central elements of it. Namely, man's standing before God. We stand condemned before God. We now say phrases like, I want to be the gospel to those around me rather than I want to preach the gospel to those around me. The modern gospel for many churches is preached through mercy projects. Papers. Mercy projects like this. Preach the gospel by going to Mexico and building suitable housing for the poor. Preach the gospel by sending drillers to Africa to dig fresh water wells. Preach the gospel by stopping sex trafficking. Preach the gospel by feeding and clothing the homeless. Preach the gospel by opening shelters for abused women and children. Preach the gospel by providing anti-abortion counselors staged right across the street from abortion clinics. Preach the gospel by promoting racial and economic equality. You know, do the stuff Jesus would do. Be the hands and feet of Jesus. Preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. It's no wonder that you have a whole... Bible study of collegiate students that don't know what the gospel is. They're confused. We're confused. Because the gospel can be anything now. All those things I just mentioned. All those good mercy projects I just mentioned. That is what the gospel has turned into. These good and righteous activities, they've become our functional gospel not our words but our activity we suppose that by doing them we are evangelizing when 
Sadly, evangelism almost never takes place in projects like these. We think that we are being the gospel because we build a house for somebody who needs one. We assume that our loving works are enough to transform lives. When did our works have the power to overcome original sin in the soul? When did our works and building projects for others in need, when did that trump the saving power of the Holy Spirit? And so we exchange the truth for a lie. We commit idolatry. We begin to worship the process, the project, the being the gospel. We begin to elevate ourselves. We build whole churches and programs on this. And we say the Lord is in it, and it is nothing more than idolatry, the worship of self. Churches will build their membership on these activities. They promote this type of false gospel, not discerning that it's impure and worthless and unable to save souls. It doesn't save souls. We don't read our Bibles well. Christ and his disciples didn't involve themselves in hands and feet ministries. They weren't out supplying the latest need. They went out proclaiming as a herald, proclaiming, declaring the gospel that saves. They said things like, God commands all people everywhere to repent. And repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And unless you repent, you too will all perish. That was their gospel. The enemy has lulled us to sleep with our busyness. The consequence of this impure gospel is false converts fill our churches. False teachers rise up, churches fight and they split, the money runs out, and churches die. We all are aware of this. From one generation to the next, one generation the church flourishes, the next it's dead. How can it be so weak? How can it go so quickly? Because it's built on an idol not on a foundation of Christ. So then, what is the gospel that the apostle, the apostle gospelized them into? What is it? Well, in verse 3, I can almost hear the apostle Paul thundering at this point. He's written this long letter to this church that has had nothing but factions and infighting, And I can hear him almost thundering it at this point, saying, For I delivered it to you of first importance. you got to get this square in your mind, Corinth. This is primary. This is priority. First importance, what I also received from the Lord Jesus. That which I received, I give to you. You must give it preeminence that Christ died for our sins in accordance to the scriptures, verse 3 says. This is where the gospel begins. This is what must be established, that Christ died for our sins. The gospel is the good news That Jesus substituted his perfect righteous life to the point of death for our imperfect, unrighteous lives. The gospel is the good news of Jesus sacrificing his innocent, sinless soul for our guilty, sinful souls. The gospel is the good news of Jesus absorbing the wrath of God that has been stored up for us. 
The gospel is the good news of Jesus paying the ransom owed to God for our sinful rebellion. Death, the ransom required. For our sake, God made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And this gospel, this pure gospel, the only gospel, is according to the scriptures, Paul says. It's not new. It's the gospel that you find in the Old Testament. That is the scriptures. In the Old Testament, we find in Isaiah 53, the prototype of the gospel the original gospel. There Isaiah, he tells us about the coming Messiah. He tells us of Christ. And he says, verse 4, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that was led to the slaughter, like a sheep that's before his shearers is silent, and he opened not his mouth. Yet it is the will of the Lord to crush him, to put him to grief, to make his soul an offering for sin. There we have it. The gospel of first importance. Secondly, of first importance, church, the gospel is that he, Jesus, was buried. He was buried. Dead people get buried. Jesus truly died from crucifixion. He didn't fake it, he didn't crawl down from that cross. But his body had to be taken down and buried. Again, this is according to the scriptures. Isaiah 53 verses 8 and 9, 9 tells us, By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. According to the scriptures, Christ really died and was placed in the grave, buried. The good news is that his death confirms that he poured himself out for man and he paid the price owed to God. For the wages of sin is death. And so he was buried. Lastly, the last thing of first importance, church, is that he, Jesus, was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. See, not only did the righteous Christ substitute himself for our unworthy souls, not only did he die in our stead to satisfy God's just wrath, and not only did he go to the grave as a dead man, but he was raised. He was resurrected from the grave, just as the scriptures foretold. This element of the gospel, his resurrection, this is priority. Not because we get a home in heaven, but because his resurrection affirms God's righteous demands were met. His wrath is assuaged in Christ's death. His holiness is satisfied in Christ's death. His justice is met in Christ's death. 
The resurrection of Jesus confirms all of this and secures our place and our standing before God. Again, this element of the gospel is foretold. Quoting Isaiah 53, verses 10 and 11. There we read, He, referring to Messiah, He shall see His offspring, and God shall prolong His days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in His hand, and out of the anguish of His soul He shall see and be satisfied. How will he see his offspring? How will he be satisfied? How will he see? Unless he is resurrected. Unless he is raised to see these these glorious things, this glorious work that he has done, the fruit of that. Elsewhere in the psalm, Psalm 16, we know that the psalmist writes, that the Holy One of God, the Holy One of Israel, Messiah, He will go to the grave, but He will not decay. He will not rot in the grave like we do. But He is raised to see His posterity, to see those that He has died for. Now church, this is the pure preaching of the Gospel. All those other things, they might be applications of it. They might be good, but it is not the pure gospel. The gospel cleanses you from your sins. The gospel justifies you before God. When you stand before him declared not guilty, declared righteous in the Son, the gospel sanctifies the saint in God. This is why Paul says that you are being saved. It continues to sanctify you and transform you and to conform you into the image of Christ. The gospel is of first importance and it cannot be substituted by anything else. Now to the unbeliever, I say this, You must believe on Jesus and his work alone for the forgiveness of your sins. I urge you to think on those words. If you've placed your hope and trust in anything other than than him, it's worthless. It's a fool's errand. You're deceived. The only forgiveness for sins is in Christ alone. You must place your faith in Him. Trust that He is who He says. Trust in His work. Trust in His merit. Trust in His person. You must flee from your sins. You must turn. You must repent. God is calling men everywhere. He is commanding men everywhere to repent. That's a, that's a command to all of us. We cannot escape it. And so for anyone who is lost, or if you've put your trust in those mercy projects, if you've put your trust in the system of the church, don't. Flee to Christ. Flee to Christ. Run to Him. For today is the day of salvation. If you hear my words, do not harden your voice. Harden your heart for my voice. Excuse me. Do not harden your heart. Hear his voice. Respond to him. And to the saints here at Garden Lakes Church, we cannot put our faith in mercy projects. 
cannot put our faith in some magic bullet program. We cannot put our faith in the preacher. We cannot believe that we are preaching the gospel without using words. This is idolatry. I fear that it has gripped the church because getting in and getting your hands dirty and get involved in a project, it feels so satisfying, so Jesus-like. And yet he would say to you, tell them what saves their soul. As I said, this is idolatry, but I believe it's idolatry of the worst form that we must repent of. Because it glorifies our gospel of works. And it denies the power of the Lord's gospel of faith. It glorifies man. Christ will build his church. But he does not do it through the hands and feet of men. He does it by the power of the gospel that is in the spirit. I'll leave you with this quote from the late pastor and theologian R.C. Sproul. He has written, the gospel is the only gospel. There is no other. And to change its substance is to pervert it and indeed destroy it. Anything that we do to change the substance of the gospel and pervert it destroys it. And it renders it useless and powerless. Please pray with me.